Mid America Furniture's new location, 7546 North Milwaukee Avenue in Chicago. Mid America Furniture, special prices for the holidays, now specials on sofas, sleepers, and Ashley mattresses. New collection on dining tables and bedrooms starting at $6.99. Mid America Furniture, we're going to have a Aturai, or the Ministry of Shinne, Haradagzet, the signature by Ashley, Millennium, Benchcraft, Sierra Sleep, Coaster, Jackson, Catnapper, Global Furniture, USA, Pulaski. Itlu financing available, line of furniture, ka 50%. Off. Her had a Tihana Monday through Saturday from ten to six, who Sunday Mun had the Sahel Hamsha. Ask for Mr. G for an extra five percent off. Mid America Furniture, seven seven three seven six one two one zero six. Thank you all for being here. My name is Alter Sargon, and I will be the moderator today for the Drug Awareness Panel. I would like to take the opportunity to welcome His Grace Marpolis Ben Yaman and the clergy from the Assyrian Church. I would also like to welcome Lincolnwood Village Trustee, Mr. Jaisal Patel. Thank you to the President of the Assyrian National uh, Council of Illinois, Mr. Shiva Mendo, for allowing us to host this discussion here at Mitwa, and thank you to the Assyrians around the world for broadcasting this event. I would also like to thank Mrs. Carol O'Raha, Mr. Steve Ewell, Dr. Timothy Yuhana, and Ms. Nicole Piro for their contribution to today's panel discussion. I would like to start by asking His Grace Marpolis Benyamin to say a prayer before the panel discussion. <laughs> داخل بشمية أوب أرعا هل لخما سنقانا قد يوما شقلا خوبين داخل توب أخنا شقلا دينا دارا لا مورطلا جورابا إلا باصلا من بيشا سبب ديو خلا ملكوتا خيلا تشبخت الأعلم المين آمين Thank you and may God bless Let me start by introducing today's first panelist Dr. Almer Abu is an internist and palliative care physician he currently serves as the Strategic Medical Director at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois. Prior to his role there, he was a Medical Director of County Care, a Medicaid-managed care plan sponsored by the Cook County Health and Hospital System, where he also practiced internal medicine as a hospitalist. Prior to his administrative career, he practiced as an academic hospitalist at the University of Chicago for over a dozen years. Dr. Abu completed his residency at the University of Pennsylvania and completed medical and law school at the University of Chicago. He has a Master's of Business Administration from Northwestern University. Please welcome Dr. Abu. Um, th thank you, Atur. Um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to come to you tonight and to have a chance to, to talk. Um, this is a, a real honor for me. It's a real honor to be with all of these you know, distinguished uh, speakers as well. Um, I think it's, uh, uh, you know, great that there's this much interest in this topic on one hand, and on the other hand, it's, um, it's obviously not a, a happy topic, it's a sad topic, but um, it's important that we all be educated and, uh, you know, know how to recognize the problem so that we can help to address it. So, um, obviously, drug abuse in 2019 is an epidemic. There is absolutely no doubt it's an epidemic. And there is no community that is immune. Um, and I'm sure that there are people in this room that have been directly affected with very personal stories. Um, and um, it doesn't take that long to, to sort of know someone who's been directly affected. In 2017, there were 72,000 deaths in the United States due to drug abuse. If you do the math, that's about 20 out of 100,000 people. Um, so whether or not there's, you know, in the Chicago area, there's probably 100,000 Assyrians. There's probably not 20, but it's it certainly had effects. Um, and uh, how did we get here, though? How how did it get to a point where there's 20 out of 100,000 deaths? The, the the drug epidemic that we're seeing now. It, it, it's, it's been gradual over the last 20 years. I'm going to explain how we got here. But it's not, it's not the drug abuse that people may have in their minds 
from the 1970s or 1980s. It, it's different. Um, now, uh, you can't see some of the colors on this slide, but um, um, th this graph shows the, uh, the various deaths by different types of drugs. Let me walk you through what's been happening in the last 20 years, and it'll sort of explain how we had that trajectory of increased deaths. Um, Again, you can't see the first, you can't see the green too well, but the, here's the green. Um, this is deaths from sort of traditional narcotic prescription drugs, um, um, morphine, Oxycontin, Oxycontin Oxycodone, um, Percocets, but Percocets uh, is not quite as strong as some of these other ones. Um, so there's, you know, currently about 15,000 or so deaths. It certainly started to accelerate in the late 90s. Why and what was happening? Well, what happened in the early 90s was there was, a, frankly, a very strategic effort by the pharmaceutical industry, and it was multi-pronged. Um, they came to medical schools, and I was a medical student at the time at the University of Chicago. They came to medical schools and they advocated that, you know, you need to treat pain more aggressively. Pain, is, um, pain should be treated as if it's a vital sign, as if it's impor as important to a person's survival as their heart rate and blood pressure. I mean, it was a little weird, but at the same time, there was that aggressive push into nursing as well to make sure that nurses, you know, would ask patients, are you in pain, are you in pain? patients in any pain, nurses would call the doctor, say the patient's in pain, don't you want to give a pain medication? And this was sort of pushed and accelerated partly by pressure from the pharmaceutical industry. At the same time, a drug um, was released um, in 1996 called OxyContin, which um, was a, it's a more powerful version of morphine, but also had a special technique that it allowed for a longer, lower, a, a longer, slower release of the drug into the bloodstream. And so because of that, the pharmaceutical representatives would basically make the argument, this drug is not addictive because it goes into the bloodstream slowly. And so you can give the medication and people won't get that immediate high. Um, and so we were being sold, frankly, in retrospect, a lie that it was okay to give these drugs Patients aren't going to get addicted. And then what, to some extent, there was some illicit use of these drugs, and particularly with that OxyContin drug that I just mentioned, patients would figure out that they could crush the pill, and then they could take the pill, and they'd get an immediate high with a much higher dose. And so there was this aggressive abuse, there, there was this abuse that developed. At the same time, as you had patients um, um, asking for more of the drug, N nurses asking for you to treat the, you know, pay, uh, treat the pain with, with more of the drug. And so practice patterns for doctors really did change in the 90s. And you saw patients going home after like very simple surgeries. Before you used to just get higher doses of um, anti-inflammatory medications like ibuprofen, but now you were going home with some Percocets or some morphine or some oxycodone. And that wasn't the way that medicine was practiced prior. But what ended up happening is that once patients started getting exposed to these drugs at, you know, modest doses, but still they're so powerful that five and 10 years later, they found themselves addicted and dying. That explains that curve um, going up about 10 years after this sort of effort of marketing occurred. Then the next, in, the next inflection point is the deaths that happened in wave two by heroin. So you see the heroin deaths were fairly flat in the early 2000s, and then it accelerated around 2010 and climbed. What was going on? The patients that were addicted to the, the narcotics from, from things like morphine and oxycodone, um, the more traditional narcotic pills, they couldn't get the doses that they needed illicitly from either lying to their doctor or getting it from their friends. They could only, they, they, they were getting it tolerant and dependent and addicted that they needed a more powerful dose, a more powerful medication. So they went on the street and they bought heroin. And, and so then essentially at that point, the heroin deaths start to climb. Um, and the heroin deaths are patients who, or people who clearly at that point were addicted. They're, this is not like, 
you know, casual use. The final sort of swing in this third wave of, of this epidemic, which I, I apologize, you can't see the blue line, but the blue line is, is really there at the bottom and then it comes up and then it goes up that way. And so you can see that it, it is accelerating since 2014. And what is that blue line from? That blue line is fentanyl. And fentanyl is essentially a manufactured narco narcotic. It's incredibly powerful. It's 50 times more powerful than normal morphine. That drug in, in just really small doses, if you are not exposed to narcotics prior to that, if you're not on pain medication, and you get just like a grain of sand of fentanyl, that can kill you. It's an incredibly powerful drug. Um, but if you're a heroin addict and you're looking for that high, you need fentanyl to, to get you that high. Because even heroin's kind of not quite, it's kind of like not the best high in some respects. And so you, you escalate and you elevate and you keep pushing and pushing. And at some point though, you push yourself to overdose and you die. Um, now that said, if, if you take fentanyl um, and you are not exposed, you, you just frankly will die. And at this point though, the, the illicit market for fentanyl is huge because because it's so powerful and strong, you only need small doses like I said. So this was a bust that just occurred by um, the customs um, in Arizona. It was just reported this past month. They, they captured 254 pounds of fentanyl. They hid it in the bottom of a semi-truck or something like that. So they had a false floor in the truck. This 254 pounds, it, you know, it's, that's it. That's, that, that's as much space as it takes. That's 50 million doses on the streets. It's, it's, it's I don't know how many millions and millions of dollars it is, but it's, th this is not the only large bust that's occurred in the country. Like there's, this, was the, this is the largest bust that's occurred in our country. But in the last year, there's been 100 pound busts, 120, 20, you know, 150 pound busts. So it doesn't take much. So you can imagine that for if you're a drug dealer, this is an attractive product to sell. And, and so what people are also doing, what drug dealers are doing, are, is they're taking just tiny amounts of the fentanyl and they're lacing it in heroin or they're lacing it in fake prescription drugs that they're selling on the street, whether it's Xanax or whether it's oxycodone or what have you. And um, so what ends up happening is, is people, um, you know, kids, teenagers, thinking that they're having some fun, you know, maybe buying some Xanax on the street, they're having a party, here, have a pill, they share it, and frankly, they're not waking up. They're literally just dying. And it, it, it's a naive drug, it's a naive user, it's someone who's experimenting. But I will say that today, to explain some of this massive rise in fentanyl, um, it, to explain this massive rise in fentanyl is, is absolutely um, people, first timers, you know, first timers that just thought they were experimenting and, and they're dead. And so this was a news report as well in, in January where, you know, 12 young people are hospitalized and one died. A couple more would have died if they didn't receive emergency rescue with Narcan. So it's not safe to use, use your friend's drugs or trust your friend that's just, hey, I got some pills. It, it, it's not safe. The, the only prescription drugs you should ever be using are prescription drugs that were prescribed for you by your doctor. No ifs, ands, or buts. In this day and age, if to do anything else is frankly Russian roulette. So that said, many people are getting their drugs from their friends. Just don't, don't do it. So what are the risk factors? Basically, most drug abuse stems from experimentation, but it's experimentation for someone that's you know, motivated because they're otherwise stressed, 
they're anxious, they're depressed, it's that person that the experimentation actually is more attractive, right? Um, but you take someone who has a little bit of stress anxiety, you, you have a little bit of experimentation, assuming that they don't die right away because they took some drug laced with fentanyl, they slowly develop tolerance, maybe not so slowly, it depends, and then once that tolerance develops and the person keeps going back to the drug for that rush, that high, then essentially the person is addicted and just moves down this spiral, this cascade. It's, complete, it's completely self-defeating. The initial experimentation might give you this incredible high, but it's, it's immediately self-defeating because frankly, once you get past that period of experimentation, it, it's completely out of your control. Um, that's the very nature of addiction. I, I'm sorry I lost the microphone. Hopefully you guys can hear me. Um, let me give you a couple quotes. Um, in the beginning, it feels really good. You're paying to get high. And toward the end, you're feeling really stupid because you're paying not to be sick. In your mind, you can be OK. You can do just one. But one is too many, and a thousand is never enough. One is too many, and a thousand is never enough. That, that is, in so, way, in so many ways, like a layman's explanation of addiction, right? Now, many people might think that they actually have the willpower. I have the willpower to overcome this. The reality is that's a myth. Your willpower is enough to make a decision to experiment or not to experiment. But once you've experimented, your willpower goes out the window. It is essentially these drugs, it's not like taking candy. These drugs are, are not like taking a piece of candy or, or having a, a, you know, a, a tub of ice cream. You know, that's fun and it's nice, it's pleasure, right? These drugs are changing the biology of your brain. They're, they're changing the way your brain, frankly, processes information and works. And so essentially, it's short-circuiting your brain. It, it, there is no way your body can naturally um, uh, fight, fight that sort of um, feeling of high once your brain gets stuck and used to it. The, the, maybe the analogy I'd like to, to con you to consider is if, if you were you know, an athlete and you're, you know, you're like working out or doing your training and stuff like that, and you're in top shape, that's great. But if you're competing against an athlete who's using steroids, the, the, like you, in some ways you can't compete. The, the drugs are essentially like your brain on steroids. You can't compete, you're, you're, it, is, it is a different, brain. It is a different process. And, and so you shouldn't even try. Is that working now? You shouldn't even try. The willpower is only good enough to prevent experimentation. It's not good enough once you've experimented and once you got stuck. So there are a bunch of toxic side effects. These side effects aren't enough. As bad as they are, they're not enough to overcome the addiction because your brain gets fixed on it. And the withdrawal after you've been on the drugs is so bad that essentially you'll do anything you can to go back and get more drug to avoid the withdrawal. And I've, I've taken care of like, you know, 18, 19 year old kids in the hospital. You detox them, you, you want them to go to a rehab facility and you can tell that they have no interest. They're going back to the street to get more drug and there is nothing you can do. You can beg and you can plead, but you, they won't listen to you. They have to crash, crash before they're willing to sort of accept that type of help. Um, there, there are obviously serious medical complications long term. I've taken care of many of these patients in the hospital. Um, the, some of the worst are infections that into the bloodstream that go into the heart. You, let, you literally could need a life-saving heart procedure where you have to actually put um, a, a fake or mechanical valve in the heart um, to recover the, the broken, damaged heart valve from the infection. Um, I've seen a 37-year-old lawyer um, come in with abscesses in her skin and um, in, in thigh, in her arm and her thigh, 
where she almost lost her arm because the infection was so bad because she had been skin popping the heroin underneath her skin. I don't want to dwell on those things. What, can you, what are the earlier signs? What are the things that you, you can be aware of? Anything that sort of changes, it's, an, it's a change in the person's person, their personality. They become irritable and easily annoyed. Um, too much sleep, too little sleep, weight loss, weight gain, issues at work or school, withdrawing from friends and family. You look at that list and you're like, well, wait a minute, that doesn't look like drug abuse to me. What I'm saying is, is when, you, when you get to the patient who's got the really aggressive drug use, you're going to know that they're a drug addict. Like, they're not going to look the same. What I'm trying to do is give you the warning signs that could put someone at risk for even experimenting with drugs, or, when, or they're starting to use drugs in the very early phases. And that list looks exactly the same as someone who's depressed or anxious, under a lot of stress. The, that is the risk factor. Those are the risk factors. And so if you see someone who has those red flags, that they're just not right, you can tell something is wrong with them, that that's when it's time to start, you know, knocking on their door, calling them, texting, what's going on, let's go out to dinner, these kinds of things. Um, that said, I'm going to let some of the other experts on the panel discuss the sort of more psychological and, and social aspects. Thank you, Dr. Abbo. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Dennis Giliana. Dr. Giliana graduated medical school from Tehran University and did his psychiatry residency at Chicago Medical School. He is American board certified in psychiatry, has a master's of public health and community health, sorry, uh, health education and health promotion from UCLA, and is an elected member of Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Medical Society. He is a fellow of the American Psychiatric Association, senior clinician educator at the University of Chicago Pritzker School of Medicine, and a three-time recipient of the Mark Fahami Award for Passion for the Field of Psychiatry and Care of Psychiatric Patients. Dr. Giliano. Good evening. Uh, first of all, I would like, on behalf of many people in our community who are suffering from one form or other of mental health, I would like to thank Mark Polus and the clergy that are here. Last week, there was a conference in uh, Illinois Psychiatric Society. The president of American Psychiatric Association was there. Something that was mentioned that currently in the United States, from every 10 people who have mental health, only four of them somehow get the help, and only 50% of them, they see a mental health professional. So it means that currently in this country, 80% of people who have mental health do not see a mental health professional in any shape. And we, I don't think that our community is better than that. And we think one of the main reasons for that is the stigma that is in the community, almost in all the communities. So religious organizations and churches have a big role in uh, deconstructing that stigma. And I'm very happy to see that our church is very active in this uh, process. I remember last year, Gashon Tuan ar ar arranged something about this drug abuse in uh, his church. Gashagi Vergas Tuma asked us in St. Andrews to have a panel for a discussion for drug abuse in that church. So these are good, very good steps. Saying that also before uh, I go over the topic, I would like to uh, tell, I know that most of you that are here, you don't have any problem with drugs. But you know somebody in the family, somebody in the community at school or others that uh, they are uh, dealing with this uh, alcohol pro or drug problem, let's call it substance abuse. So uh, those people, usually they are hated by their family members. Their family members, they don't like them. When they are in the community, nobody likes to be close to them. When they go to the hospitals, believe it or not, hospital staff, they don't like dealing with them in any discipline. When they go to pharmacies, I think they are people in the pharmacy that they work in, they are not excited to see them. But at the very end, let's remember that they are human, just like me and you. 
and like every other human, we are in need of somebody listen to us, somebody be passionate to us. So let's always remember when we look at them, we are looking at the human being. And let's not think that because we don't have their problem, we are better than them. We have our own problems. So that's one thing. And the other thing is that we want to be nice to them, listen to them, but we don't want to be fooled by them, just like we don't want to be fooled by anyone else. Okay. So today we'll uh, start with, these are some definitions about just, you know, when we talk about addiction, what do we mean by it? The National Institute of Drug Abuse says that uh, this is the definition that they use for addiction. It's a chronic illness. Chronic means that it doesn't happen overnight. It takes time. So because it takes time that it starts, also it takes time that we be treated. That people in the treatment, Rania and Ramson will tell you more about it. And the other thing is that it's compulsive. So that I, will, I will go over that and it's difficult to control. So it's not if somebody like, uh, uses a drug that also can control it, it's not addiction. But once it goes out of control, that's addiction. And uh, these are the other terms that maybe you hear, hear we're using. When we say tolerance, means that by time, we need more of this substance to get the same effect. So that's meaning of tolerance. And when we don't receive that tolerance, then we have something we call it withdrawal symptoms. In between, there is something we call it sensitization or reverse tolerance. People who go to rehab, their receptors are being desensitized. So when they come back from rehab and they want to do drugs and they go back and take the same drug that they used to do it before rehab, so then they, it's just for them it will be like overdose and they die. And this is whatever we see very frequently. And dependence is a term that now from 2015 we don't use it that much, but it means that a person who has either tolerance or withdrawal symptom to a substance. Again, I will not go through this uh, chart. You have seen it and we talked. Whatever we want to mention in this is that uh, in 2017, the rate of the people who died because of overdose, especially overdose on opioids and prescriptions, was much uh, higher than people who died because of car accident in this country. And 87% of those people who died, they were not suicidal. So they didn't want to kill themselves. It happened accidentally. So this is what our Dr. Elmer said, that current drugs that are on the street are dangerous drugs. When we talk about the models that we look at, how we look at the uh, drug abuse, there are two main models. One is called moral model. Maybe many of you that are here, you believe in that. Moral means that the person uh, makes bad decisions, so faces the consequences of it. And if he has a weak willpower, he cannot do it. So many believe in that. There is not much evidence for it in medicine. In medicine, we go over the disease model that we go over. I will talk about it. But what I, why I brought the moral model? Because that's the way that legal system looks at substance abuse. Uh, Officer George will tell you more about it later. But in the, from psychiatry point, I can tell you that if a person commits a crime because of not being able to differentiate right from wrong due to effect of a substance. It's not a base for defense because of reason of insanity. He will be counted guilty and is accountable for action. So when we talk about a disease model, so when we look at this disease, just like any other disease, we should look at four major parts, bio, psycho, social, spiritual that these can ha have effect on the cause. We look at them when we want to uh, treat, and also when they are very important when we want to think about how to prevent the problem. From neurobiology, whatever we, I want to just very, uh, in summary, just say there is in brain, there is, is there's different systems. There is a system, we call it award system. When we say system, it means a circuit between neurons, the different parts of the brain, mainly in the basal ganglia. So the, the whatever we have from our system, we believe this system is there in the body to help us with survival. We get some award when we feel good about ourselves, food or mating or those things. 
But when these substances, they come and interfere with that uh, uh, circuit, so they change everything. It becomes compulsive, and uh, all the reward will be to find the substance and take the effect of it. So the life will be turned just to have more, of, more and more of the substance. These changes that happen in this system, some of them are permanent. So many people, they need for life medication. And we also we know that there is some genetic predisposition for this problem. So from this slide, I want you to remember two things. One, this is a biological illness part of it. So uh, for treatment, we need some biological. It's not the old times that they used to say people who use opiums 13 days do not use it with cold turkey, they will be out of it. Those were for all simple opiums or uh, heroines in the past. Nowadays, it can be life-threatening, and also it's not unhuman. Uh, detoxication should be under medical supervision. And some of them, even for uh, maintenance, they need to be on medication biological treatment. The second thing is that we said there is a biologic, uh, uh, genetic predisposition. So if any of you, or anyone else who listens, has a brother, sister, a cousin, who have problem with substance abuse, genetically is more predisposed to this problem. So if they want to try, or whatever, for fun, one of these drugs, there is a high risk of uh, getting dependent on it. As they say, a snowball may turn to be avalanche. Psychological point. There are different theories about how, why people, they do it and how they look at the, at the drugs. Uh, from the main parts that I want to say, one of it is that they look at it as a defense and they look at it as a maladaptive behavior. Defense for what? Defense for inner rage, inner anger. More, um, more, all of us, there are times in life that we feel that we are inferior to others. They are not pleasant times. Some people, that's the feeling that they have all the time. And that's the time that we say that they have problem with their self-esteem. What, how this self-esteem happens, there are different theories, and mostly we believe there is a wrong core belief in them that they think they are not good enough, they are uh, not likable, they are not lovable, and because of that, they are willing to do anything else to uh, get rid of that feeling. Some of it is numbing themselves with this, uh, substances. Some of it is to do whatever others uh, want. A cool group in the high school, uh, uh, some people, uh, gang, gangsters, we do whatever they want so they will like us. It's very bad not to be likable, but it's, we all want to do whatever that people like us. As we said, the problem is the core belief. The feeling that I'm not likable or I'm not lovable is irrational, and that's whatever should be addressed. The, the, Sorry, because of the sake of time, I will be faster. So the, the, uh, the other issue, so it's, um, they think in behavioral that they, maybe it's a uh, way that uh, they learn it from parents. If, if a parent come home and just say, you know, I'm so tired, I, today I had a very bad day, let me give, get a glass of alcohol to relax. This is whatever children maybe hear that. Or when a, when a brother or sister said that, you know, let me get a hit of this drug in order to feel good, maybe they feel about that. So, and the other thing that also is important to know, as we said, in alcohol abuse, we see 30% of people, they have comorbidity of uh, substance abuse. When we go to drug abuse and opioid abuse, studies they show from 50 to 80%, they have this comorbidity. So more than half of the people that they do it, they have underlying depression or anxiety that is good to be addressed, even from adolescent years in, in high school. There is another thing that is very, very, very um, uh, uh, prevalent in those population, and that's ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactive Disorder. And here I want to say mostly to the parents that and when uh, school sends your uh, note that your child needs to be treated for ADHD, many parents, they say, okay, we don't want to treat them because we don't want them to, get, to go to college. We don't treat ADHD people in order to go to college. Uh, although if that happens, that's very, uh, very great. But the main thing is that uh, the risk of substance abuse, risk of divorce, risk of uh, car accidents is much higher in uh, people with ADHD. 
and we used to say, okay, treat your child with ADHD in order not to get and become a pothead. This is whatever they say. So this is very important. And also ADHD, as we go through environmental, a peer pressure is uh, that you have all heard about it and uh, the feeling of being inferior. What things that here, again, I want to mention, like for example, uh, uh, in, a, in your class, in your group, maybe you just trust somebody and you write, you just say that you have a crush for somebody. And the night you see that goes on social media and everybody makes fun of you or writes some comments that makes you very angry and, and rage. Or if you go to a party and somebody takes advantage of you or makes fun of you, you feel very angry. So what's the best thing to do at that time? My suggestion is that, you know, your parents, your priests, they all have been teenagers in some time of their life. So it's good to go and consult them. Not go and find somebody else, not go and find a consult on internet, on, on the social media, what people they will suggest you to do. Not to go and ask your, your my, my friend has a cool mother, I will ask her why my, uh, this friend has a boyfriend or girlfriend that they have gone through this, they will tell me what to do, no. It's good to go to people that in your uh, very f uh, next family or your church, counselors. And my uh, advice to the parents and the counselors is that when the kids come and talk to you and they when this happened and they are already ashamed of what already have happened, they are not there that again you tell them, you know, you didn't listen to us, so this happened. Just listen to them and just say everything will be okay and you two can work and come up with a plan. So that's very important. And uh, as we said, uh, physical sexual abuse and early exposure to drugs also is very important to that. The last thing that I want to talk is the spiritual part that we think uh, works on this. We call it self-transcendence. Self-transcendence is part of character. Character is part of our personality. Variables in character we are not born with. We learn them throughout life. There are like self-directedness, cooperativeness, and self-transcendence. Self-transcendence means how much we can get above ourselves and think about others. In many studies, they think people that they are drug abusers, they just think about themselves. They cannot think about their family, their friends, others. They are very much into themselves. So one of the ways that we can prevent it is this. Uh, we work more on self-transcendence. Self-transcendence is a spectrum. We can be lower or higher of it. Self-transcendence by itself has different variables. One of them is spirituality. Spirituality means believing in higher power, that when you are in trouble, you can go to it and, and pray and get help. And that's what I think you, you, most of you are from church groups and what most of you, you learn. So it's good that in your church, you work more on your spirituality part and believing in uh, our God and the Lord and the, and the power that they have and they can help you. And if you come up with any doubt, don't get upset. Just go and ask your teachers, your priests. You know, I'm in doubt. Help me with that. That, will, that is important. The other part of self-transcendence that's very important, we call it interpersonal identification. Means that we, we feel somebody else's pain, pain and want to do something for us. You know, I love it when before Thanksgiving, uh, somebody from Margie Vergis youth group calls me and asks for some uh, collection for donation for a soup, uh, kitchen, uh, soup kitchen that they uh, do for uh, Thanksgiving. This, that's a great idea. Not only it's a, like act of kindness, it's a charity, it's also good for the kids that they are doing it. It will increase their, uh, this, their spectrum of interpersonal identification. They know why they are doing this. So more of these things will help. The other part of uh, self-transcendence is self-forgetfulness. Self-forgetfulness is that what we learn how to enjoy from the environment around us. When we see a nice flower, we enjoy it, a nice painting, a nice music. This is whatever we learn in life. So we are living in a great city for that, all the museums or people around us. So if you have more of those enrichment programs for kids and for youth also will help with that self-transcendence to be able to think about others besides themselves. I think that was my presentation. Thank you very much.
اسيجان مايكل 8844 Mid America Furniture's new location, 7546 North Milwaukee Avenue in Chicago. Mid America Furniture, special prices for the holidays, now specials on sofas, sleepers, and Ashley mattresses, new collection on dining tables and bedrooms starting at $6.99. Mid America Furniture, we're going to have to buy the Ministry of the Signature by Ashley, Millennium, Benchcraft, Sierra Sleep, Coaster, Jackson, Catnapper, Global Furniture, USA, Pulaski. It's financing available, line of furniture, 50% off. Her had a tikhana Monday through Saturday from ten to six, who Sunday Mun Khadisar Hal Khamsha. Ask for Mr. G for an extra five percent off. Mid America Furniture seven seven three seven six one two one zero six. خیلی مخربتی بشه قانو خان من خا آخر زخات دیلی بتهای قانو خان من سنخ رتونی کالا گراکوس آمد بتوانی لچک ایمیل سر هدف زیه ول قانو خان لیگل ادوایس چت شپتا این اتلاف خان اخنو خان ختم از نقیات قانون و دن ایمیل ات tsk ات کالولا دات کام هدیه بشه قانو خان من ده آخر زه اتونی کالا گراکوس خیلی مخرب تپ دیا شپتا ایل باس ورکرز کامپنسیشن Workers' compensation deals with injuries during the course of employment. For example, slip and fall, lift in heavy boxes, whether you get hurt on your shoulder or your back, stuff like that. The number one rule with the workers' compensation case is to notify your employer. injured during the course of work. How about there's two ways you could go about doing it, written or orally. Written is via fax or email or an incident report that your employer has. How about you have to let the job know you are injured. That's the number one thing. If it's very serious, we recommend you get an ambulance, whether it's your employer calling it or yourself, so you can seek the medical attention you need. Now, during the course of your tenure with regards to getting treatment, you're entitled to two doctors of your own, or you could attend to the employer's doctor. It's up to you. If you do seek uh, to seek the doctors of your choice, we have to put it in court so we could get the approval from the Workers' Compensation Commission. If your doctor renders you disabled or permanently disabled, we can obtain 66% of your wages while you wait to return to work. Manai 66% zuzi diokhni shakleto no agushula masak shaklechlu while you're getting treated for the injuries you sustained. At the end of the case, we can also get a lump sum. Lump sum deals with the percentage of how much you were injured compared to the amount of how much you make. Now, as always, the ultimate goal is to put you in the same position as you were prior to this ever taking place. Our number one concern is for you to get your health back. If you guys have questions, concerns, or comments regarding workers' compensation, feel free to give me a call. Again, 847 982-9516. We have offices in downtown Chicago and the suburbs close to you. Thank you. We all have that one person we call, no matter what the situation or event. Who do you call when you've had a stressful day at work? When you get the news that you're having your first child or that you landed your dream job? Now, what if you or a loved one have been injured and need advice? Who do you call? Think about it. Thank you, Dr. Giliana. Our next speaker is Ms. Rania Jendo. Rania has a master's in social work specializing in mental health. She currently assists adults living in nursing facilities, transitioning to living independently in the community. Rania? So to talk about addiction, drug addiction, um, we also need to address the mental illness in our community because it's not talked about enough 
and mental illness is common among people who struggle with substance abuse and substance abuse addiction. And some substance use has a link to triggering mental health condition that were not there previously and can appear when individuals um, use certain drugs. And studies have found that among individuals with non-alcohol <clears throat> substance use disorders, 28% had co-occurring anxiety disorder, 26% had mood disorder, 18% had antisocial personality disorder, and 7% suffered from schizophrenia. Mental illness can be linked to drug use in both ways. For example, if an individual has schizophrenia, oftentimes they try to self-medicate and numb the voices. Um, by either drinking or using drugs. But then on the flip side, some individuals who use drugs may or may not have a predisposition to mental illness and can then develop psychosis or other symptoms even after they're sober and will use such um, synthetic marijuana or meth. And many people who regularly abuse drugs are diagnosed with other mental health issues at some points. And studies have shown that people who are diagnosed with mood disorder, um, anxiety disorder, ADHD, and depression are nearly um, twice as likely to have substance abuse disorder. As one can see that there is a strong correlation between mental health disorder and substance abuse. And it is very important for our community, for our Syrian community, to be educated on mental health because it's an issue that our community faces but is not well aware of because we don't tend to discuss it or address it. And I think it's time for us to be able to discuss both the mental illness aspect and the drug addiction and put an end to the stigma. So when seeking treatment, for both mental health disorder and substance abuse disorder, it is very important that you find a facility that is equipped with the staff that's necessary to handle your loved one's um, treatment. There are many uh, community mental health agencies, facilities that treat individuals with both mental illness and um, drug addiction. You can get connected with your community mental health agencies in your areas. Um, they're all over Chicago. If you need, we'll be more than happy to help you find any facility. Um, not only do these community mental health facilities provide mental health um, treatments, but they also provide drug addiction programs for individuals seeking treatments. I would also recommend that you take advantage of their counseling programs. Um, it is very important for individuals to seek counseling during their treatment to assist with the battle of addiction and to be able to talk about their struggles during the process of them becoming sober and clean with the end goal of being able to live a healthy lifestyle and be able to overcome any situation that might trigger a relapse. So seeking counseling also will provide the individual with being able to address what their triggers might be, and to be able to act on their, on their um, trigger before they fall into a relapse. However, it is equally as important for the family members to be able to seek family counseling. Um, family counseling will allow family members to be able to learn the right and wrong ways to approach addiction, treatment, and recovery. When a loved one goes away to treatment, family is left um, often feeling hurt, angry, and they tend to blame themselves for the outcome of their loved ones. Um, <clears throat> so family counseling will provide many benefits for the families by understanding the disease of addiction, helping addicts and their families to reestablish lost connection explaining the addiction process and the family role, and distinguishing between helping an addict versus harmfully enabling and explaining the role of codependency in addiction and its danger.
this will be a long process um, that the family member and the loved one will go through. But with the help of you know, attending family counseling, um, understanding the disease, it can be overcome, but the individuals will always be working on their sobriety. Thank you, Rania. Uh, our next speaker is Mr. Ramsan Kasha. Ramsan has been in the field of addiction treatment and mental health for 19 years. He's a licensed clinical professional counselor and certified addiction counselor. Currently, he is the executive director of the Eastern Region for the Hazelden Betty Ford Foundation. Ramsan? You know, what I'm going to talk about a little is some is stuff you've already kind of heard bits and pieces about. I'm, I'm going to talk a little more about how it comes out in treatment and also how it comes out in your everyday life. Um, so you heard a little bit about my history, my, my professional history, and uh, the, the thing that I, and even talking with the esteemed panelists here, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful to be here. Uh, I've, I've spoken in front of large groups and in front of the media, small groups, professionals, all these different aspects, and yet these are the events that I'm most nervous at, it, just to be completely honest with you. Um, so you know about my professional history. I'm going to tell you a little bit about why I'm nervous uh, at these events. So maybe I won't be as nervous. We'll see. But 20 years in the field, a lot more in the community. You know, this is my community. This is my family. The people sitting here uh, mean the world to me. And, and I want to thank, and we've already thanked Marpolis, uh, the Qasha that are here, uh, Shiva uh, Mando also for helping us secure this event and letting us be here. But I really want to thank all the rest of you, too, for coming and making this an important event, because this is an important event. I, I was born to the church. My, my parents were involved in Assyrian communities. My aunts were involved, still are involved in, in many different things. I, I met my wife in the church. I grew up in the youth. Um, this is my community. And it's one thing to go to work, and, and I'm not heartless, obviously. I see people suffering. I feel bad, and, and I feel compassion and sympathy and empathy for it. But then I see it hit close to home, and it takes a whole different meaning for me. So when I'm asked to be here, I jump at the chance. And that's why this is where I'm most nervous. Addiction is a disease, 100%. It is a disease. It's a devastating disease. I've been in the field for 19 years. I have heard more people dying who have gone through treatment in the last five than I did in the 14 years before it. It's escalating. It's moving quickly. The thing that really gets to me is, as you saw with uh, Dr. Guliana's presentation, that addiction is by far, not even close, the leading cause of accidental death in the United States, by far. And what devastates me about that is that it is treatable and it is preventable. And yet it's still killing more, um, more Americans accidentally than anything else. So we have to focus on it. We have to look at it. We have to talk about it. That's the big thing. So, you know, I, I, here we're, gonna, we're focusing a lot on heroin. That's important. It's really important. I want to pull back from that for a minute and say you cannot forget about other drugs. Alcohol remains the most deadly substance of use and abuse. It's affecting more people and, and, and killing people. It's still the number one substance. Marijuana is another one. And, and the reason I talk about marijuana isn't because, oh, what's harder, this or that, or should it be legal? I don't get into that conversation. The fact is, the marijuana we're talking about now is not the marijuana that all the science has studied. It's not the marijuana from the 70s or 80s. This is a different kind of weed, is what it is. We're talking about marijuana that's easily 30 times more potent than it's ever been, ever, at least. And the scary thing about it isn't how potent it is, it's how accepted it is. People don't feel like it's harmful because their friends haven't been harmed by it. And that's where it can be devastating, in itself and also as a gateway to other drugs. And we talked a little bit about how we got to this point, how we got to the opiate epidemic. I don't have any science to prove this, but my gut, my clinical gut tells me that our cultural acceptance of marijuana has spearheaded this movement too. In the past, when when an uh, adolescent or a you know teenager, or young adult wants to rebel, they'd smoke some weed. But if that weed is is the stuff that you're getting from your parents, or your parents have accepted it, it's not enough. 
It's not rebelling anymore. So we have to up the game. That's the terrifying part of it. But I'm not going to focus on that. I'm going to bring it back to, to heroin. Also, we're focusing a lot on the youth. We need to focus a lot on the youth. I see it's like the whole youth group has shown up, and I, I don't know if you guys are over there, but definitely in this crowd, I see a bunch of you. Um, the fact is, as I pull back, it's not, this is not just a youth disease. I don't want parents and, and loved ones to walk out of here thinking we gotta really watch our youth. Yes, you do, but watch each other, watch your parents, watch senior citizens. Everybody is being affected by this. When we talk about the youth, and this is what, what the, the presenters before me identified, when we talk about the youth, the primary place they're getting their drugs, their pain medication especially, is from the home, is from the friends. It's not from the street or the internet. I mean, that becomes the way, but, and, and look, I'm, I'm an Assyrian, I grew up in an Assyrian household, I know how it is. I get this prescription, I put it in my fridge, I use some of it, and the rest stays there. For me, if I need it later, or God forbid, I become a pharmacist for my friends, and, and it's like, oh, you have pain, I've got this. That is causing a lot of this drive too. There are ways to dispose of this. If you have a prescription, and the time of that prescription is passed, or your need for that prescription is passed, get rid of them. Don't throw them out. Don't flush them down the toilet. There are ways to do it. Uh, you know, they, we've got information at one of the tables back there. You know, the water reclamation plant on Howard, which everyone knows because you smell it whenever you drive by it. You can go take them there.